Good evening. If all of you outside are worried, we've saved lots of seats up front for you. Please come in and join us. Welcome to the Gender Reset panel. My name is James Abraham. I'm going to be your moderator this evening. I'm from the India Kamal Nayan Bajaj Fellowship. The reason I can pronounce it is because I practiced. <laughs> Where's Peter? Uh, <laughs> So I've got three great panelists, uh, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. They will tell you who they are, the fellowship they're from. They'll also tell you what kind of work they're doing and their action pledge. Let's start with Lisa. Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Ski Tatum, Henry Crown Fellows Class 2012, True North. I am founder, yeah. I am founder and CEO of Landit. We are a tech platform that creates a personalized playbook for every woman who's seeking to move her career forward. And my action pledge is to democratize career success for women around the globe by partnering with companies and strategic players to unlock the talent and potential of an incremental 30,000 women in 2018. Hi all, I'm Ref Rodriguez, and I am with the, uh, thank you, I'm with the Bahara Fellowship, uh, the original class. We call ourselves Original Sin. I did not um, coin that, but, uh, so I am also a member of the Board of Education for Los Angeles Unified, and as of two weeks ago, I was voted board president, so got a lot going on there. <laughs> Thanks. And my pledge is to significantly increase the number of young people who are entering dual language programs and graduating bilingual and biliterate in Los Angeles Unified. Thank you. Hi, my name is Suzanne Beagle, and I'm a Caddo Fellow based in London. And my Aspen Action Pledge is to mobilize 1,000 investors globally, individual and institutional, to move more money more strategically with more velocity with a gender lens by 2020. Thank you. My work, I, should, I suppose I should say something about my work and my life is about investing with a gender lens. Uh, so I'm a systems entrepreneur. I just learned that phrase. Um, I am really about shifting market systems and helping people see the power and the possibilities to see gender in their investments as a way to really unlock uh, the potential that we all have. Um, I'm also co totally committed to moving my own portfolio in that direction, so I stand here both um, as someone who's doing this myself and also someone who's influencing others. And I'm looking forward to being here with all of you tonight. Great, thank you. <clears throat> now, I know we stand between uh, you and some fine wine. <laughs> I promise you we will be intoxicating. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, a few minutes talk to the panel, and then we'll open up for q and I'd like to talk to each of you about the work that you're doing and your action pledge, and about why you think uh, that is a very important issue to deal with. And uh, Lisa, you talked about democratizing success for women. What are the issues that stand in the way of that, and what do you hope to achieve in the, in the longer goal beyond the 30,000 that you had targeted? Sure. So Landed actually was my Henry Crown Fellows project. And early on, some of the moderators said, you know, Lisa, think boldly. So I figured I'd better start a company so they'll let me graduate. So we're really looking at the millions of women who will find themselves at an inflection point, whether they're in a company and they're just trying to figure out how to more successfully navigate, or maybe they're somewhere feeling stuck and they don't know how to get out of it, or maybe they're in transition and looking for what's next. And realizing that as you progress in your career, the more challenging those inflection points become, so much so as we sit here today, you have the largest number of professional, educated women, not firing on all cylinders, but they want to be. And it's not for lack of motivation or track record or skills. It's that big whopping question of where do I start? And how do I connect with the tools and the humans and the resources I need? But on the other side, you have companies saying, I'd love to hire more women. I can't seem to find them. But more importantly, when I do have them, how do I invest in their retention, development, and progression? And we looked at that and said, it's actually not a supply issue or a demand issue, it's a market failure. And so we wanted to put something in place that more successfully path the individual, but give the company a turnkey, one-size-fits-one solution. Because if you think about it, men and women start out with the same ambition, but after two years, women have a 50% drop. 
and it has nothing to do with work-life balance or family. It's that question of, do I have the tools and the resources and the access I need to reach my goal? So we said, let's knit together all those key elements for success, level the playing field so that everyone has a chance of reaching their goal. Thank you. Ref, you're in the uh, LA school board system. And uh, how do you see this issue of gender within that school system as you look forward to the next set of generations that are growing up? Yeah, so let me give you some context. So Los Angeles has uh, 640,000 students. Uh, we have over 1,100 schools. Uh, we also have uh, over 200 charter schools and some of the most high-performing charter schools in the nation. Um, so we really are educating the next generation and in some ways are either, well, actually I believe that we really are perpetuating uh, gender bias in our schools and, and we are certainly um, uh, trying to make sure that we overcome that. And so let me just tell a little bit about the work that we're trying to do around STEM education and ensuring that young women are um, both recruited and interested in this pathway and field, uh, working with outside partners uh, like uh, the LA Promise Fund and others who are just being very intentional about making sure that young women are interested in high paying careers that are in the uh, sciences, uh, technology and engineering. The other thing, and I'm gonna talk, so is also we have a huge issue with our African American boys in Los Angeles, where uh, they're basically disappearing from our schools, they're still in our communities, but they're, we're pushing them out of our system. And it's really important that we really do focus on them as well and ensure that they are entering uh, the workforce and college and, and careers uh, ready. And so we, so we see it from both angles, right? That it's not just about ensuring that young women who haven't had opportunities in certain uh, spaces are given those opportunities, but also ensuring that those young men who are not uh, graduating and are not being part uh, a productive, uh, being part of our system that are also enabled to do so. What are the key issues that seems to be stopping them from exploring STEM as a career or any or stay within the schools? So it really is, you know, we acculturate uh, young women to believe that they are not good in certain uh, uh, certain areas, right? And and it starts all from the beginning in terms of what we allow, what we provide for our children to play with. Right, so some of the gender uh, already very, very crystallized, uh, here's uh, what boys play with and here's what girls play with, right? Then it goes further. We don't see a whole lot of women who are teaching in our sciences, uh, in math, uh, especially in our high schools. Um, and so young women don't see role models out there. The most wonderful thing that we had, a gift that we had this year was, of course, hidden figures, right? And in Los Angeles, they filled up uh, the um, uh, Staples Center with young women to watch this film and then have a dialogue about uh, seeing themselves in this work. Wonderful, thank you. Suzanne, uh, as an investor, you've chosen a very specific lens through which to invest. Uh, why, why is that important? Is that a big gap? And how do you see that having a ripple effect over time? So first of all, it's multiple lenses um, that you could think of. Uh, and I'll start by saying that people often go immediately to thinking about women entrepreneurs and their access to capital and what's happening with venture capital or angel capital to support women entrepreneurs. Some people will automatically go to women on boards and women in leadership in public companies um, and what are we seeing in corporate. Some people think, well, what are the products and services and the opportunities around sort of recognizing that women are 80% of the purchasers of products? Uh, and where the massive market opportunity is to pay attention to women as customers. Um, or they go and they talk about the issues that disproportionately affect women and girls. Lack of access to energy, clean water, access to sexual and reproductive health products, access to education. So how are we thinking about products and services that are really designed to address some of those inequities? Um, one set of lenses is to say the issue that I really want to tackle is access to capital for women entrepreneurs, or I want to support women on boards or in leadership, or I want to support uh, those products and services that are either market opportunities or market def deficiencies. But a different way to think about it is that every single person here tonight is working on something where gender is a factor, whether you're conscious about it or you're not conscious about it. There are gender patterns, and you talked about a few of them, in energy, in construction. I had an amazing hike this morning with someone in construction. Um, in uh, agriculture, in education, where there are systemic cultural social norms 
that are holding people back. In some cases, there are regulatory and policy things that are holding people back. In some cases, it's literally lack of access to just information or technology. And so the opportunities to start seeing gender whenever you're thinking about products, services, companies, investment, are tremendous. And I was thinking about something, you, you, a game you play with kids where you say, um, start noticing red cars as we're driving down the road. So you're, no, you're not noticing red cars, you're not ro noticing any particular cars. All of a sudden you say, start noticing red cars, and all of a sudden you see red cars everywhere. How do we get people to start noticing where there are gendered patterns which are unequal? And when I was hearing Peter talk this morning, we talked about you know, what, what moves us, what motivates us. Fairness is kind of my number one thing. Fairness and fairness in every context. And so when I, why I do the work that I do is because I think that there are so many places which are just systemically unfair. Mm -hmm. And that if we can be using capital, using finance as a tool for social change around these things, um, that that is a tool that has been underutilized. That we often think of pub public policy, we think about education, which is essential. We think about our role as consumers. We think about what are we doing around women in corporates. But I think we don't think as often about how do we use our investment capital to either drive capital directly to businesses that are the good actors or to think about the portfolios that we already have and to start asking questions. So much of what we do at Aspen is asking good questions, but also listening for different kinds of answers and seeing patterns and saying, where if I made a comment about something, asked a question, insisted on something, can I, all, can I shift something in an investment I'm already in? And that's whether I'm an individual or an institutional investor. So my work spans from individual to institutional, and I think each of us here have the opportunity to think about about what role we play as individuals with our own portfolios, what role we play in our organizations, but what role we're also playing from a societal level in all the other places that we influence. If we sit on an endowment board, if we sit uh, in, on an investment committee of a venture fund, if we sit um, uh, in, a, in a public sector agency that's deploying investment capital, um, just to be thinking about where can we start to ask those questions. So I'm, I'm obsessed, really, about how do we use this set of tools around investment to shift the system? We have our young fellows join, joining us today as well. If you uh, look out over the next five to 10 years, very quickly from each of you, how do you think that their world on the issue of gender will be better? Or are they going to be facing the same issues um, that you've been talking about? Who do you want to start? I'll start. So, <laughs> I'm really heartened by the fact that we are making headway mm -hmm. on issues around violence against women, on issues around women's access to technology, on women's access to capital. I, I get to be around good stories, and yet it is just nowhere near moving quickly enough. And so I think whether people who are here see a significant change in the next 10 years is gonna be significantly up to us to make very, very conscious shifts. I don't think it's gonna happen automatically just by dint of where things are going. Thank you. I'm an optimistic person by nature, so I've gotta keep that, that optimism. Um, but I will say that, um, so one of the last gifts that the Obama administration gave in terms of education was that they basically just decreed we must all provide um, non-gender bathrooms, right, in, in our schools, and Los Angeles Unified embraced that, and we, we moved forward um, in, in a tremendous way. And then this past week, I put out a statement, along with my board vice president, basically condemning this issue of, of uh, transgender peoples in, in the military, right? So I, it's my hope that in 10, 15 years um, that we, are, we begin talking about gender in the same way that we're now talking about sexuality, which that the, it is sort of a spectrum, right? And that um, people don't all fit on one side and the other. There's a whole bunch of, of in between. And, and as a result, we're gonna, we're, we have vocabulary and conversations that ensure that gender is a lens that we look at in terms of what we do every single day and that we're intentional about that. Thank you. Well, I'm very encouraged. I have two teenage boys, and they don't have the baggage that many of us come to, I think, or come to the table with, um, but they are aware, and they are not shy at calling it out. 
And so I am very optimistic as they've seen more role models, as we try and be role models, that they're not gonna tolerate some of the things that have happened in the past. Right. Well, one of the things that I'm really excited about is the work of ProMundo and some of the organizations that are working on with men and boys on issues around gender equality. Hmm. Because I think it's something that has really been overlooked in, the, in so much of the conversation around women and gender equality. Is, and you brought it up, is where, where are we working with boys um, to really be learning a different, different patterns? Um, but also, what are we doing around men and social norms? Hmm. Around, you know, what does it really mean to be able to take paternity leave or to be a more engaged father or to be uh, saying, I'm actually going to opt out of my career for a year or two and go to something else? I mean, how are we making that acceptable or not acceptable? Mm -hmm. And we need also to have men and women working on these issues together and this systems change together because it's not about fixing women. It's really about the opportunity that we have to, as we were on the hike this morning, pull each other up, whether it's a, a man or a woman. Right. And there also seems to be a shift from this, you know, child care is a woman's issue versus this is a family issue or a societal issue or a corporate issue. So you see that moving even with some of the policies of companies. So it's no longer, you know, woman, you have to address this alone mm. because it impacts us all. So let's, um, let's push, push this idea of vision one more level. So this is the gender reset. I'm an engineer. Whenever I think of reset, I think of a big red button. <laughs> so we have a big red button. And this is not like the reset on your phone, which requires a little prick to push it. This is gender neutral. So uh, anybody can push it. So uh, what I'm going to ask you is, um, would you assume that this is how it's going to work? We're going to push this button, reset gender. The idea of differences in, as a gender politics no longer exist. What would the world look like for you? First of all, would you push the button? And second, what would the world look like for you in a situation like that? So I absolutely would push the button with two hands. And that would mean that women would no longer have to suffer in silence. And by that I mean there is a social cost to admitting that you need help and you don't have it all figured out. Or perhaps you don't see the possibilities or you think the opportunity cost is too high. So I imagine a world where everyone is free to bring the full measure of their talent on their terms. Imagine what that world would be. Thank you. I'd be right there right behind you with, <laughs> <laughs> with, um, with both hands as well, um, maybe even getting a couple of hands from other people, Just push this thing down, get rid of it, um, reset it. Um, and it would be equal work for equal pay, right? It would mean I have nieces. Um, I don't have children of my own, but, and I only have nieces in my family. And I think about their world, and, and I want them to be able to, to find a partner, whoever that is, that understands who they are as a person, not because they're a woman, um, but just who they are as a person. Um, I also want to make sure that in this reset, we're not blind to the fact that there are some differences, right? And, th and that we appreciate those differences and honor them and, and, and see them as complementary to, uh, to others. Um, and then the other thing is I, I would see that we are in a world where every young girl is, has access to school and is in a school. Like that's, I mean, that has to be our number one priority in some ways, to make sure that we have young women in school learning and being able to, uh, to be part of uh, of this world. I would have every single person in the room, yeah, come in and push the button together, of course. Um, one thing before I talk about my vision around the capital side, Paul Hawken, who is a friend and someone who I've followed for so long around climate change, and you know I'm a Caddo fellow, so I want to bring in the environmental piece here, um, uh, just did a book called Draw Down. How many of you have seen it? It's an amazing book, which really does the math on how do we really address climate change and what is it going to cost, really sort of gigaton by gigaton, uh, really what are we going to do to address climate change from a getting carbon out of the atmosphere perspective. And it's a hundred things. It's a start. It's not a, a book that's published and, and game over. It's a start. But the first hundred things that they looked at, which they think are the highest potential, uh, are about all kinds of things that you would assume around environmental uh, differences. So transportation, housing, energy, alternative energy, the whole picture. But number six is access to girls' education. So girls having access to education globally. And number seven is access to family planning. Equal access 
so that women and girls can make choices about when they choose to have a family and how many kids they have. And if you combine six and seven together, they're number one. So in a climate change book, in a climate change conversation, we're talking about girls' education being the single, these two things being the single biggest thing we could do around that. So getting people out of the mode of thinking, oh, this is that, those sort of women's issues, or those are kind of those girls' issues, and recognizing that it, it is part of everything. Um, that is what that looks like when we have a reset, is that people get that. And from a capital standpoint, I'm, I'm uh, part of my life right now is at Wharton Business School in the Wharton Social Impact Initiative, and I'm tracking public equities and private equity and venture capital that's going towards women or not going towards women. Um, and in my future with the reset, everyone has equal access to capital. They understand how to make use of that capital. And women are as powerfully using their own investment resources as men are. Mm -hmm. Um, both individually and institutional. Women are directing that capital, not just receiving that capital. And that we are creating the opportunity that if you want to see women in construction or you want to see women in energy or you want to see women in agriculture, that, um, that they have access to the technology, the knowledge, the understanding, the capital, the tools uh, that help them to thrive. And in turn, that solves for all of the SDGs, all the sustainable mm -hmm. development goals, food security and climate change and health and well-being and the whole schmear. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. That's great. I'm very conscious of time. Before I go down my next list of questions, I want to open it up to the floor. Are there microphones around? Any questions? Yes. Right. Uh, Great panel conversation on uh, some important and not always easy issues. I'm curious for the panel's perspective on women's role in supporting women in some of these red car kind of biases that, that uh, one of you talked about. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Sure. So I think it's uh, imperative that we not only help each other, nurture each other, pull each other up, but women alone are not going to solve this. And I think often what we see as, you know, whether it's diversity or women's issues, it's like find the woman, find the black person, uh, check that box because they got it. And when you think about the corporate America, it's going to take both, right? So it's going to take, you know, women not being over mentored and under sponsored, but women being sponsors, men being sponsors to actually move the needle. So I think one of the worst crimes is if women don't help, but we can't solve it alone. And also, women should be supporting women. Uh -huh. And women should be investing in women. They should Absolutely. be backing each other's venture funds. They should be backing each other's ventures. They should be supporting um, in, so if, if I'm thinking about investing in public companies, um, then I should be supporting pay equity, flexible work, women's advancement in the okay. corporate sphere. Um, and it, I, again, back to my hike in, this morning, um, if you are one of those only women in construction or only women in a particularly gendered area, um, then you have an opportunity to be looking around and saying, how can I bring five other women with me? Mm -hmm. And then as investors, again, we get to support that by saying, this is really important to me, and I want to hear about it. I want to see it in the reporting. But I, I think it's hugely important that women show up for each other mm -hmm. and um, recommend another woman to be on a board, recommend another woman to be on an investment committee, recommend a woman to be a venture partner in a fund when somebody calls you. And yeah, the men need to be there too, doing that just as much. But uh, you know, who is it? Um, was it Madeleine Albright who talked about women not supporting each other, mm -hmm. other women? Um, it's, for me, the, the number one thing. I'll go down. Oh, yes. To your left. I'm just wondering if you guys know about uh, mentoring situations where men can mentor women and women can mentor men. Because mentoring is a two-way, it's a win-win thing for, for both mentor and mentee. So uh, thinking about this, I'm, uh, I'm wondering if, if, if I as a man could benefit from mentoring a woman or, or vice versa. Have you seen models like that? No, I, I've seen some beautiful examples um, in, again, I'll just keep coming back to, I don't know why I'm talking about construction so much, where, um, <laughs> where there are women entrepreneurs who are being mentored by male entrepreneurs 
um, who are a few steps ahead of them and really making a huge difference in their career advancement and their ability to grow their businesses. There are also um, women who are mentoring men in corporates. In, I live in the UK, so in the banking uh, arena, there have been some great examples where they've been very explicit about having women mentor men so that the men can also see what the unique talents, skills, opportunities are uh, that really come from hearing diversity, hearing di diverse perspectives. And in education, I mean, we see this now uh, in a tremendous way in the STEM fields because so many of the professionals are not women, right? And mm -hmm. so men have stepped in and have decided to take on that role in terms of mentoring. And it's, it's a really important thing that anybody and everybody should mentor. We all should have, you know, be mentoring uh, folks in, in all the work that we're doing. But, uh, but for men in particular who are in places where there aren't women, they do need to step up and take that role. And there also needs to be some um, approach to working so, so that men know exactly how to do it as well, right? So my mentoring you is not me making you more masculine, right? Or more, you know, oh, that's, mm -hmm. I'm the wrong person to say that. But anyway, um, but you know what I mean? It's, it's, there, there is an approach in a it's way. It's reset. No, that, that's only weird. <laughs> that is responsive. Yeah. And, that, and so there is, needs to be some, some work done on ensuring that uh, male role models do have a, 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 an there. approach. Sure. Yeah. And I've certainly seen examples where it goes both ways, but I will say I have never seen a widely successful mentorship program, regardless of the way. And that's because sometimes it's too heavy. You cannot lay at someone's feet, you know, will you be my mentor? No one wants to take that on. So what we talk about is codifying your network and understanding who's your mentor versus who's your sponsor versus who your point expert and having a very specific ask. Because there are a lot of people who want to mentor, but they don't know how. And so when you make it bite-sized and you go to the right person with the right ass, with the right frequency of touch, that's how you start to develop those relationships, whether it's you know, woman to man or man to woman, as opposed to, you know, will you solve everything for me? Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Chris Heidi. Thank you so much for addressing this topic. Um, I know that over, over the past you know, decades, generations, the concept of, of gender roles has changed. The concept of masculinity and femininity has changed. Um, Ref, you had mentioned a little bit that we should also consider the differences. I'm wondering if you might be able to sort of speak a little bit more about how you view the differences between uh, male and female or masculinity, femininity within this construct that you're talking about. And he said ref, but anybody else could actually <laughs> chime in here. And, and really, I, I have to go back to this thing about that, that, it, that there's a spectrum here, the way that I'm thinking about, about gender, right? And, that, and so there's a lot of, um, of um, that, that even though we're naming femininities, uh, we're naming it that. I mean, I have a lot of female in me. I was raised by a strong woman, right? Um, and, and to be able to identify that that's something that I got from her not my father, right? That it's really important that she put that into, into the person that who I am, right? So being able to sort of just um, uh, appreciate that there are some things that happen that, that, um, that get passed on uh, that, are, um, that come from uh, one versus the other. I didn't say that very articulately, so please come and help. Well, I have, <laughs> I have a friend, Hala thomas Thatir, um, who has a great TED talk, by the way, about um, gender equality. And she talks about masculine values and feminine values in everyone. Mm -hmm. And she has an investment thesis around investing for uh, a balance of masculine and feminine values, which is very unusual. But she's such a smart investor. And um, it has shaped the way that I think about when I'm interviewing and, and I'm doing due diligence on a deal um, to say, who is bringing what to the party? So if I'm looking for teams that are really strong teams, and I'm looking for how they make decisions, how they collaborate, how they uh, get things done. And it may be uh, sometimes that the collaboration really is coming more from a guy on a particular team. And the just get it done, um, I just want the facts and I want to make something happen is coming from the woman. But there are tendencies. I, I hate to generalize, but there are tendencies. And this aspect of women, be, women being better around collaboration, nurturing, thinking about communication, thinking about how people are affected um, is, is true. Uh, and there, I mean, there's, there is data ab around that. And so I don't want to say that there aren't men who have really strong feminine values. But by and large, if what we're looking for is success, whether it's in our businesses, whether it's in our public policy initiatives, whether it's in our nonprofits, um, successful outcomes, we're going to 
we're going to benefit by embracing what each player brings to the party. Thank you. No, I would just say it's, it's equal, not same. Right. And I found that in my days as an investor, when we made investments in women, their ability to uh, bring the entire community and uplift the community, sometimes those tentacles um, spread um, longer and deeper when you invest in women as opposed to men, and men do it as well. So I think it's dangerous to stereotype, but there are some um, Thank you. typecast characters. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Tom. I was, as I was listening, I had this thought around how do we try to learn from both the positives and the negatives that have occurred. And the one that I don't have a, I know they're probably good positive case studies, but the one that really occurred to me was what happened with Uber. And I'm wondering if anyone, if you know of anyone that's working on a case study around Uber to bring that into business schools and other places to learn um, in a very concrete way, um, in a very specific way around some of the issues and things not, to, you know, what not to replicate or not to do again. My guess is Uber is not a loan case not at from all. what you've told me. No. Uh, do you want to start? Uh, so I won't comment on Uber, but I will say that they're not alone. And sometimes, at least what we find is, it's not the big overt things that are dangerous, it's the microaggressions, right? It is those unchecked things that go on, not kind of the one day, but the other 364 days. And so there are lessons to be learned because, again, men and women have to be in this together. And it's about calling it out, recognizing, but giving people the tools and the language to address it. So um, I know of at least two organizations that are looking at not just that particular company, but just in general, how do you address that? Because those tend to be more hurtful than the more overt things that happen. There's some really good work going on on unconscious, unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. Uh, and which we all have, by the way. Which men we all have, women. men and women have, right? But Iris Bonet at, at Harvard, um, there's a study, um, there's a center at Stanford that's working on this. And um, the, you know, whether it's, you're talking about in the tech industry, whether you're talking about in any number of industries. Uh, but the Uber case is so new, I, I don't know that anybody's working on that particular case. But um, yes, there are people, I want to zoom out and say, there are people who are starting to think about not paying attention to gender is a factor of risk in a in an organization and from an investment, again, I'm wearing the investment hat, an investment perspective. So we're so used to thinking about the upside. What's the upside potential of investing in women, creating more jobs, creating gender equality, but also what's the downside risk of not paying attention? And so the fact that some of these things are, are starting to really come to light, even though they've been going on for such a long time, um, and, and that it's showing up as material risk in an investment and really hurting people from a valuation standpoint, that I'm as, as depressed as I am about these stories, I'm really glad that people are starting to get it, that it's also about risk. And if I could just add to that, I, I'm not sure five or 10 years ago, Landa could have existed, because I think this notion of bringing, of gender equality in the workplace, before was a nice to have. And I think now it's a recognition of it's a competitive imperative that you leverage everyone in the workforce. So I think just that consciousness and that acknowledgement that this is a balance sheet issue as well, not just the right thing to do, uh, gives us hope for, for progress and how we can move forward. So would we, would we um, in this 10 to 15 years after the reset, would we still use the construct of gender? Is that, is that well, I definitely think, t especially talking to teenagers Sorry. that I know, <laughs> uh, that, that that the definition around gender is evolving. I, my friend Joy Anderson at Criterion Institute, who I think is doing some of the smartest work around gender and investment, has a project around envisioning the future of gender. What is it, what, how are things gonna shift? How does work, how does it come into the context of work? How does it come into the context of care? How does it come into the context of uh, family relationships and responsibilities? And if, again, as investors, we're trying to look into the future and predict what's going to happen in the future so that we can make smart investments today. And so they have this project around what if, in their big reset, things really look different? Then how would we be investing? And we talked about the gig economy at lunch. We talked about uh, AI and big data and the, the influences of disruptive tech. We need to be thinking about all of those things. Yeah in a context of what, what happens when those things are shifting, but also what happens yeah, as gender roles shift and social norms shift. Actually, uh, before I come, uh, you have a question. Before I come there for a second, I wanted to push on this. I'm going to take moderator's license and ask for some personal advice. 
so uh, one of the questions that I struggled with, which I shared with the three of you when we met, um, is that I have a young partner in our firm, a young woman who's uh, I mean, spectacular at what she does. And she's clearly said, look, in a couple of years, I'm going to have a child and step off, step out, which troubled me, which I don't understand. I mean, I understand is the wrong word. I don't want that to be the norm. So what's going on? And you know, simply saying maternity leave, paternity leave, all that is easy. That's easy. Flex time, I, that's all doable. None of that, apparent from what I, my discussions with her, is going to solve the question. I bet Lisa has a, a great answer on this, and I'd love to talk about it. Sure. So in that case, not knowing the individual, what we find is sometimes it's that opportunity cost. So I take maternity, what am I going to come back to? Or what are going to be those trade-offs? Or how am I going to be perceived? Or where do I go from there? So this notion of not even understanding what the possibilities are and thinking there is no choice. And so we see um, that language going on externally mm -hmm. and internally, uh, that it's a risk, right? Mm -hmm. And that you can't have both. But, it's a, but you're, you're not alone. We hear it all the time. OK. I, I want to keep pushing on this only because um, she's a co-founder. Mm -hmm. So what she's coming back to is, I mean, very so, But what is that trade-off, right? What is that opportunity cost of being a founder? And boy, do I know that in spades. <laughs> what you have to sacrifice in order to push on that, and then what does that mean for your family? And what are the implications of you being able to be there and be present? So it's this constant, I don't believe in work-life balance. I don't even know what the heck that is. I believe in hyper-prioritization, because that's what I have to do on a daily basis. And it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult when you think about those real-life trade-offs, especially when you are a founder and you want to be a part of your children's lives and your husband, of course. So I'm a huge believer in human-centered design. I love design. you in that order. <laughs> <laughs> I think as we're designing solutions um, mm -hmm. to problems that we're seeing, I think the key is to ask the people that, are, that we're purporting to affect. And we talked about this aspect of becoming proximate last year. Um, I think asking her what's driving mm -hmm. that decision, and she may, some things may be conscious and some things may be unconscious, about, yeah, about her choices, about her opportunities around societal pressure, around her, her partner, her family, um, what, what is she coming back to? But from the things that you can control, what's your scope of control as a business, mm -hmm. to be thinking, yeah, about those policies and practices around could she uh, come back in a different uh, role? Could she come back in a job share? Could she come back mm -hmm. in a way where you, you set up a crash at the business so that she can have her kids around her? Maybe uh, there, there are a set of possibilities that other people are really creating in their businesses. But I think it's so important, the social con and, and cultural and geographic construct, obviously. Um, and just what's her, what's her personal desire? We have 15 seconds for Heather's question. Okay. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we had a conversation the other day which was about inclusion generally, right? And um, the, the one thing is that there's been a lot invested in exclusion. And, um, and especially when it's tied up in privilege. And so if you want to move mindsets, you often come up against those power constructs. And often to get sustainable change, you need both parties. You need black and white. You need women and men. So do you have any good examples of where you've ha had to address those mindsets that are so strongly entrenched and where you've managed to, to break through? It's because she would have the hardest question. I that's why it's the last one. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I see in the investments that I do all the time people saying a girl can't do that or a woman can't do that. Um, and I'll, I'll use an example in India called Frontier Markets. One woman named Ajay Tashah, who's an amazing woman entrepreneur, she is uh, basically a tackling energy access. And she's got women sales agents selling products to women. Those women who she's there in villages that they're selling to are influencing the manufacturers with product design. Um, they have, um, so they're women selling to women and they're uh, creating sustainable livelihoods, they're creating access to energy. And there were people who said, you'll never be able to influence the manufacturers, you'll never, those women who are, by the way, many of them didn't start out literate, will never be able to sell, they'll never be able to handle the finances, they'll never be able to talk about energy 
um, related products intelligently. Uh, the women who they're selling to will never understand their choices. And she is absolutely proving that wrong. And they, she has men now who are looking and saying, wow, if I really want to sell and make a lot of money, I'm going to have women in my sales force. I'm going to have women uh, influencing the product design. Um, and I'm going to look at women entrepreneurship in a different way. So that, to me, is a really specific example. Thank you, Suzanne, Ref, Lisa, thank you so much. I, I will close with just this. This was a little bit of a joke. But I think it is a good question to ask. Let's, what if we actually push the button and really reimagine the whole dialogue as opposed to trying to make incremental movements? We might actually rethink work. We have such an incredible point with technology, the gig economy coming, relationship shifting. It's a, it's a point in time. Incremental change isn't enough anymore. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great.